If I could go back to school, sign me up for space school on the Space Coast, specifically for astronaut training. That's right, one of the biggest private space companies is building a space school at the Kennedy Space Center. Sierra Space has plans to create the world's first fully integrated human space flight center and astronaut training academy. Now this academy will be led by Dr. Janet Cavandi. She is a space industry leader and veteran NASA astronaut. My dad and I would sit out at night and we could see all the stars. And we would uh, look at the first satellites going over and you could imagine, you know, and we would talk about what it might be like to be up there and looking back. I had the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Cavandi about this exciting development in making space more accessible. Sierra Space is building Dream Chaser. This is billed as the world's first commercial space plane. It's expected to make its first flight from Cape Canaveral in 2023. And a crewed variant of the Dream Chaser space plane is currently in development and that's expected to be operational in 2026. As we are phasing into the next um, experience in space, uh, NASA is continuing to do exploration and they have been in low earth orbit for, you know, 25 plus years um, and learned a lot. And I've been there myself. So I, I know what NASA's uh, role is. They want to now turn over low earth orbit, which is the area around the earth that, you know, where the space station is today uh, to commercial companies to try to create a new economy in low earth orbit so that people can go up there and live for extended periods of time, can, can do research in that environment and also do manufacturing in this environment to make things that you can't really make on the planet due to the gravitational forces. So there are several different kinds of commodities that we can make up there. Uh, and so the purpose of the, of the astronaut core is this a commercial astronaut core? We will still have professional astronauts that have to go up and build these space stations and that maintain the space stations. Then we will have the researchers uh, that will go up who maybe will work for a, a company, a private company, but want to do their research up there. So we would have a different level of training for them. And then finally, we would have the what we call experiential astronaut, who is someone who who wants to go experience what space flight is like, what what microgravity is like, what's it like to float, what's it like to view the earth from up there and pretty much see the whole planet over a few few days period. And there's a lot of interest by people uh, throughout Ever since people looked at the moon, people wanted to go there, right? And I'm one of those people. <laughs> I have to admit, ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to go there. Um, there, It's a very limited way you can get there, though, right? right? If you haven't in the past been a NASA astronaut, a professional astronaut, or very fortunate enough to have enough money where you could, you know, pay for that ride, which is expensive, <laughs> then you can never have the opportunity to go see it yourself. So there's a lot of different companies that are trying to bring that, that cost down to allow uh, people, more and more people to experience what it looks like. Um, so we do want to provide the opportunity. Um, my personal goal would be to allow people to stay up for maybe a week, five to seven days, so that they can see the entire planet. Uh, the night and the day cycles of each part of the planet, which is very different and very interesting. I, I love the night passes, you know, it's actually really cool. Um, and then just to feel weightlessness and to experience, you know, how to sleep in space and how to eat in space. And all those things are, are just really cool and, and something you can't do anywhere else, anywhere in the universe until you leave the planet. Oh, that is so cool. Uh, what, how has your life changed from being an astronaut? I mean, like that is such a rare job description to have. Oh, I, it changed my life dramatically. Um, I, I still, some days can't believe that was me <laughs> that got to go to space. It was something I'd always wanted to do. Like I said, from childhood, I, I worked really hard. I went to school a long time. I got a PhD just to make myself competitive enough to get one of those competitive slots. But once you get there, um, it's, it's the space flight is amazing. Uh, there's nothing that compares to it. But the other part that comes with it is the camaraderie of that really close knit group of people that train together all the time. Um, and that builds a bond that lasts forever. I saw some of my friends that I haven't seen in years over the weekend and, um, it was great. It's like you never left it. They're, they're going to be lifelong friends that you can call on at any point in time. So it's a combination of that, 
shared experience um, that's very unique, um, knowing that you did something that very few people get to do uh, and then actually go do it and come back to tell about it. So it, it's a really amazing opportunity. Yeah, what is your favorite thing about being out there? Oh, there's so many things. I, I really, like I mentioned earlier, I love the night passes of the earth. The, the one that sticks in my head the most was um, from the north coming over the British Isles, uh, which allowed us to go over, you know, London and then go across the English Channel and Paris and so everywhere in Europe that you've read about and heard about your entire life, uh, all the history related to that and thinking you're just flying over it within a few minutes, you know, and then you cross the Mediterranean, you, you see the, the heel and the boot of Italy, and then you come over to where um, the the mouth of the Nile is, and you know that you know now you're looking at Egypt and all the history that Egypt you know, has given us for all the the many millennium. It's just so crazy to think you're passing over all that history within a few minutes. And it's just beautiful because it's all lit up, and you can see the outlines of the of the continent and and the ocean. It's just breathtaking. What does it mean to you to have you know more accessibility to I don't know more regular people? Right. So that's that's exactly what we want to provide is it is really hard to become a NASA astronaut and, and justifiably so because you need people who are really going to work really hard and are willing to take the risks to do these amazing things in space. But we also want to provide other people the opportunity because the more people see the planet from space, the more you can appreciate what you know the effects of humanity on the planet are. And we can talk about those. We can talk about uh, the changes in the climate, you can, you can see it. You can talk about the clarity of the atmosphere because you can see it. So the seeing is believing part is, is the main part of you know, what we're doing up there is just showing people who can then go out and tell other people about what they saw and maybe help influence how we uh, approach the protection of our planet and um, how we you know, look at extending and improving the quality of life here on on earth because that's really what it's all about and a lot of people think oh my gosh it's so glamorous and clearly there's really difficult aspects of it psychologically yeah. physically so like i guess how would you sum up being an astronaut in a few words you know realistically here well that's that's a good question because it really is more like camping in space right because you don't have the luxury there's no baths there's no showers um you can clean yourself, but it's not, you're not going to soak in a tub, right? That's not a possibility. So when we do have experiential astronauts, we do have to set expectations. There's not going to be a suite with caviar and champagne uh, necessarily, right? It might be caviar and a little tin can that you open <laughs> or something like that. But um, it's more like roughing it. So people who really like the outdoors and really like, um, uh, going to see what is over that next hill or down that path. This is the adventure of, of going into space. Because you don't always know what you're going to be seeing when you get there. Uh, you don't know what you'll experience. Um, some people get motion sickness right at the beginning, so they have to expect what to do about that. Uh, that's why I like the longer period of time, because a few people have more t take more time to adapt. So the longer you're up there, if right. you're up there five to seven days, you got plenty of time to adapt right to all those kinds of things um but yeah it's a little bit of roughing it and uh, you sleep in a sleeping bag you can put the sleeping bag on the ceiling if you want but you're still going to be in something like a sleeping bag um your meals will come out of uh, little containers that are dehydrated most likely or where you have to put water in them and heat them up you know and uh but it's kind of fun that's part of the whole experience is yeah. that you're learning how to camp but you're camping 200 miles up and looking down at the earth passing below you. To me, a lot of it honestly sounds pretty scary. Um, you know, like exciting, but also really scary. How did you learn to like control your emotions? Yeah, I think that's something that you, you deal with, uh, ahead of time. Certainly. You, know, you don't want to wait to the last minute and then realize, Oh, this is dangerous. What am I doing here? Right. That it's something that you want to think about well in advance. Um, I, it was my profession and it's a profession I chose and I knew that there would be good things that came out of the work that I did in space. So to me, it, you know, the risk 
the reward was worth the risk. Mm -hmm. Um, For those that are going it for the experience of it, it has to be worth, you know, that experience has to be worth the risk that they take to to do the launch. Uh, You know, most of the the risk is in the launch and and, in the landing. Um, A little bit of risk on orbit due to micrometeorite uh, debris. But uh, if you feel that this is something that you've been passionate about your whole life, this is something you definitely want to do and check that box. It's something that you've experienced. Like some people want to go to Mount and climb Mount Everest. Some people have other, you know, um, checklists that they have to check off. This is, this is the big one. You know, this one is, uh, is like uh, climbing Mount Everest with respect to risk. So if you want it bad enough, and there are a lot of people out there that do, they will accept the risk to to have that experience. Any kind of a space station is amazing. I helped build the international space station. So that was so much fun to do that. Uh, Orbital Reef will have a, a main core uh, module that will have windows that face the earth and Blue Origin is providing that along with the energy mass with the solar panels that will provide the electricity, the energy that will maintain a space station. Uh, what we're bringing, Sierra Space is bringing an inflatable module to the that will attach to that core that can have a, you know, provide habitation for all, all the people up there. Uh, it's three stories tall. It's, it's really large. And this is just our first uh, first module. Um, three stories provide all the sleeping quarters, you know, hygiene, uh, exercise, the kitchen, everything that you'd want to live in. So it's sort of a, you know, your dormitory or your apartments, right? And then you can also have the same thing with all your laboratory space in it. So when you put all those together, you have a business park where you live in part of it, you work in part of it, and then you have the view of the earth where you can go down and take your breaks and just watch the watch the world go by. What do you think about the feasibility and or importance of going to Mars? It is going to be a very big challenge to go to Mars. It's uh, definitely a destination we, we need to um, start. Well, we have been starting to approach that for a long time, but it is much more difficult than going to the moon. The moon... Uh, is a good learning base, uh, a, a platform where we can demonstrate a lot of things that we would put on Mars. For instance, you know, the, the almost no atmosphere on Mars, there is no atmosphere on the moon. They're, both are very, very dusty, right? So you have to learn how to deal with the dust that are both. It will get into your mechanics of spacesuits and other operating uh, machinery. Um, and then radiation protection and how to grow uh, plants uh, on these different places. So the moon is a really good test bed. When we are ready and we think we've knocked out, knocked down all these challenges and these, um, you know, mechanical, logistical challenges, then we can take uh, a ship to Mars. We will want to pre-position a lot of things there, like the fuel to return. Uh, we can go there and make that before we ever launch people there. So you can always have fuel to return if you had to. Uh, we can create a habitat on the planet. We can get a lot of the stuff already there. So that when the humans arrive, that they have, you know, sustenance, they have protection uh, and they have a way back if if something were to go wrong. So um, I think it's very important. I I do think we should be a two planet species just because anybody who studied astronomy and understands what has happened to this planet and all the other planets in the solar system so many times have been bombarded in the past with, um, you know, meteorites and asteroids which have caused catastrophic damage to pretty much you know, every planet, although some never had life, we had life that was almost wiped out. Any of those things could happen. So if you have a species on two different planets, you extend the possible survival of our species for a longer periods of time. Is that part of your bucket list or checklist to go there someday? To go to Mars? It, it, well, it, if I were younger, yes. <laughs> But I don't think we will get there in my lifetime uh, or in a, in a lifetime where I would be an ideal person to go to Mars. Uh, you're, we're going to need the young, strong, um, vivacious people who uh, can deal with those extremities, uh, extreme environments. Um, I would say, you know, if we talk about camping and lower orbit, just going look at the at the Earth. When you go to Mars, you're like, seriously, it's like doing the, you know, South Pole analog with nobody else there, right? It's, uh, you've got to create a place, it's very harsh environment, Um, you got to make it work, or or you don't survive. So you need some really, really strong um, 
seriously uh, aggressive people to make Mars work and just start start that. And then we will bring more and more people after the infrastructure is, is going. But those first people are going to be real pioneers. Sierra Space's Human Space Flight Center and Astronaut Training Academy will recruit, train, and prepare the astronaut corps that will be required to support the commercialization of space. Dr. Kavandi is excited to train and prepare humanity for this next industrial revolution occurring in space. I really can't think of a better person to lead the Astronaut Academy for Sierra Space. When do you begin your mentorship? <laughs> well, we're going to um, be creating our syllabus, our syllabi over the next year, our selection criteria. We do have different levels depending on the skill set needed. Like I mentioned at the beginning, we'll have some of our professionals who will be, the qualifications will be similar to what NASA has. Um, maybe not quite as strict, but we do need people who can live up there for maybe six months to a year. Mm -hmm. uh, so physically able to do that, emotionally and mentally able to do that, and, you know, educationally able to do that. So really well trained. And then we'll have the people that will vi be visiting scientists and engineers who will come up just to build their stuff or, or research their stuff and learn to live in space, but primarily are there to do research. And then we'll have the ones that are going for the experience of it. So each one will have a different amount of training. We'll have a different syllabus for each group of people. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's what we'll be working on over the next year. And then we'll start our selection, our selection process, which I expect to get thousands upon thousands of, of applications <laughs> uh, over the next, uh, in about a year from now. Um, I'd like to start that um, soon after we land our first Dream Chaser. <music> 2026 is when we would put uh, a Sierra Space Dream Chaser uh, version with astronauts and they would uh, they may go visit the International Space Station uh, but most definitely they will go up to help start building the orbital reef. Oh, I can't wait to see it all. Hey, tell me about opportunities that uh, are only possible in space. Right so there's a lot of research if people want to go out and just google research that's been done in low earth orbit uh, and manufacturing there's been a lot of initial experimentation that shows what does benefit from being in space and what doesn't necessarily benefit from, from being in space. There's a lot of genetic work that I'm ex excited about, the potential of, of producing organs in space that you can actually use stem cells to create organs for people that they can then you know use for transplant. Uh, and then in that way, you don't need to wait for a donor, right, to pass away sometimes to, to receive an organ. Uh, you can have your own stem cells grow into your own organs. Uh, so I think this is a new field that will become really important in the future. And I think we'll be, you know, we started talking about banking stem cells for people. I think that's going to be a tremendous new um, area of science and uh, bio uh, engineering that people start looking at. And, and then there's a lot of other things, uh, the 3D printing of components in space because of the lack of gravity, you can create things that are more pristine and defect free for, for components that have to be perfect. Um, you can make them better in microgravity than you can on the planet. So all the, a lot of the research of course has been on humans, how to extend human life, uh, how to um, counteract the effects of, of lack of gravity and, and the way the fluid shifts in the body and it causes eye issues or radiation protection uh, on orbit. Uh, all those kinds of things we've been re, you know, researching as what NASA has been doing for the last you know, quarter of a century. So um, all that will be used to help um, buy down risk and allow more and more people to be productive up there. It was an absolute pleasure to interview Dr. Kavandi. I sure wish it could have been in person, but maybe next time. But still, I'm really excited to be able to share this interview with you guys. I plan on interviewing more astronauts in the future. And so hopefully you enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you would like to attend this space school, if this is something that sounds exciting to you. I know that they're expected to be inundated with applications, and I do not envy that process of weeding my way through the applications as Dr. Kavandi will have to do, but it is a very exciting time for the space industry and just this new industrial revolution that we are about to see happen in space.